Hello everyone, my name is Catherine Tao and I'm the host of the Data Standard Audio Experience. And today we have a very exciting guest. We have the CEO and head chef of Data Kitchen, Chris Berg. And today we're going to be speaking about Data Kitchen's story with data ops. So welcome to the show, Chris. I'm very excited to speak with you and learn more about your experiences with Data Kitchen. Oh, I'm really happy to be here uh, and excited to talk data ops. Absolutely. Let's just get started. Can you please introduce yourself? Uh, so my name is uh, Chris Berg. I run a company in Massachusetts called Data Kitchen, and we've been in business for about seven years. And we founded the company kind of based on our experience in building data and analytics in the healthcare industry. And my co-founders and I, you know, built databases, did data science and models, and did visualizations for sort of thousands of people over a period of, of seven years. And you know, we found the experience to be very challenging. And we took the experiences and the ways that we learned to solve those challenges and poured that into a software product. And so, um, and we had to give a name to our ideas. So we uh, started to call it after a couple of iterations from Agile Analytic Ops or DevOps for data science, we settled on the term data ops. And then we've been trying to get the market to think that these ideas, and we wrote a manifesto, wrote a book, um, and been talking about the concept of data ops, you know, quite a bit for the past few years. That's awesome. And so your company, the main foundation is all about data ops and ML ops. And so I was very curious about the name of your company. Uh, what's the story behind the name? How did you arrive to the name Data Kitchen? Well, okay, I'll tell you the truthy story and then the real story. Okay, the truthy story is, you know, our software really data and analytics is a team sport, right? And if you imagine a kitchen, there's a sous chef and a prep chef and people, you know, carrying things in and out. And that sort of dance of the people and their tools really matters. And it matters because what restaurants want is to consistently produce really, really high quality meals. But also good restaurants want to be able to try different menu items daily. And so that balance between sort of perfection and execution and, and invention is hard in kitchens is also hard in data and analytics. And that's the truthy story. The real story is we had a spreadsheet of like 300 name ideas and we tried a whole bunch of different ones and we ended up with Data Kitchen because we just didn't want it to be like nerdy middle-aged data guys and it was sort of fun. <laughs> and like some of the other names we had were really bad. Like we had Data Sherpa for a while, which was kind of a bad name. So the truthy story is better than the actual real story, which is we put a whole bunch of names in a spreadsheet and showed it to our friends and picked one. That's an awesome story. I didn't know the process of picking a name, how hard it would be and having a whole spreadsheet of just a bunch of names. I never really thought about it like that, but um, that's that's really funny. And so my next question is, what kind of drew your passion to data ops and to have this be the main foundation for your company? Well, a couple of things. So I'm a working class kid, grew up in Wisconsin in the 80s, and my dad was in a, a union and he drove a Toyota Corolla, which at the time was not a very common car to have. And his union friends used to make fun of him. And my dad always thought that this Corolla was, and it is, it's a better car and it was cheaper and lasted longer. And he's like, that's why I'm going to buy it. You know, at the time, American cars were really crappy. They were like, you had American motors who made these crappy pacers and Japanese cars were really good and cheaper. And so why is that? Like, why did American American factories produce crappy cars and why did Japan cars get better? And it's not because, you know, American didn't have robots or didn't have the technology. And it was really about focusing on the people and the process and Deming and the Toyota and production system. And, you know, as I got older, I taught in the Peace Corps for a while. I ended up going into software and I sort of wrote a lot of software at places like NASA and Microsoft. And then I managed teams of people who did software and I had to sort of figure out how do you actually produce good software? And during that time, there was sort of agile and the DevOps movement happened. Happened. And then about 2005, I thought I'd switch to this kind of what I thought was an easier area, which was producing data sets and data and analytics in 2005. And my life as a leader of a team was pretty hard. Um, it kind of sucked because, you know, your data providers give you crappy data, things break, you know, your customers think you can't go fast enough. People on your team are always like, hey, can I try something out? I want to innovate. And so, you know, how do you go fast, not break things? How do you innovate and have sound delivery? And that set of experiences we realized is generalizable to almost everyone who does something in data, whether it's a model or a visualization or a data set. And that sort of people and process really matters. And there's a specific way that we think that team should work. And when we started the company, we thought that that should be applicable to everyone. And so we ended up with the idea of data ops and the manifesto and, and our software. 
Yeah, and I really like how that overall process bring you to you know, all of your passions for data ops brings you to um, this. So that's really great. And so my next question has to do with some common issues that you've seen with just the processes in normal tech companies. And what are some ways that data ops and ML ops helps alleviate these issues that you've seen in technical fields? There's sort of four ways. And the first is that day in and day out, people are producing insight of some form. Right, and that process of production is fraught with errors and problems. And a lot of teams are in a very reactive mode and a very shamed mode because things are breaking and they don't know why. And they're blaming other people or blaming their things. And they walk into work in the, on Monday morning and they sort of dread, you know, sitting down and reading that first email because is it did something break? Is my boss yelling at me? And so the first is just it's a very error prone process of producing analytics and, and for a lot of reasons. And then the second is the actual ways that which you can change things and iterate and the cycle time at which you can get ideas from your brain through your hands into the keyboard and the production is a lot slower than you would think. And a lot more models don't get into production. Some organizations, it can be three to six months before that process happens. And that's just too slow. The third problem that addresses is really the fact that data and analytics is a team sport. In some organizations, even before the aspect of remote work, even working with a person on your team is hard, but data and analytics is, is a team, but it's also a team of teams. There's some, there's a lot of self-service tools. The function is uh, distributed around big companies. And so, you know, those things, error rates, cycle time, collaboration and productivity are big problems. And then the last one is people who do data and analytics believe in data. Right. We believe in the power of data. But the ironic thing is we're, we don't have a lot of data about the work that we do as a team and the work that happens during production. And I think getting analytic about our processes is a big hole in how we produce analytics. And so error rates, cycle time, collaboration, process measurement, those are the sort of pains that I see that that sort of data ops and, and model ops alleviate. Yeah, and I really like that comparison of making a tech team compared to kind of like a sports team, because you're really thinking about that and emphasizing the importance of that team collaboration aspect to really get the overall goal and job done in the end of the day. So great insight there. And so how do you think the future of data ops will be changing in the future? I think we're actually at the beginning of something really good and really big. I'm going to make an analogy that when I was a software engineering manager 20 years ago, sort of waterfall development and a lot of manual processes and manual testing was the norm. And I thought I had a team, I managed a team of 30 engineers and we could ship software every three, four months. And we thought we were really awesome, right? And we push, put it on our servers in the closet and we had our own website and we shipped some installed software. And if you move that forward now, I, you know, I wouldn't get a job, right? Being able to ship software every three or four months I'd get laughed at. Like people would go, oh, you, you know, that's not the way we do it now, right? We automate it. We make sure it's tested. We deploy with a, uh, with a touch of a button. And I think that that mindset change on the stuff around on how you do things, right? How you build systems, how you deploy them and test them, how you automate them instead of the what you do them is, is a really important change that happened in software. And I think the future of data and analytics is that people are going to realize that the how you produce data and analytics, that stuff that is not about pulling that next feature out of your backpack and, and working on it to get done. But the systems that you work in and iterating and improving upon those systems, I think will be really important. And people are starting to realize that, you know, it's a team sport. It's really complicated. The engineering problems are hard and working together and focusing on the systems in, in which we work instead of just the things that we deliver will be important. You know, just even from like a money standpoint, like the Data and analytics markets like a hundred billion dollars a year in spend, and the software sort of tools on DevOps is like ten billion. And if you mush those together, there's probably a billion dollar market at, at least around these sort of tools. And so I think. Um, as a result, a lot of companies have moved into this space in the greater sort of data ops space. There's a whole flock of companies focused on data scientists and ML ops and model ops. Just last year, there's a whole flock of companies focused on monitoring uh, data in production and they're, you know, sort of, sort of a data observability or monitoring group. And so the, the actual startup community is starting to um, kind of grow and, and which is really cool because it's, you know, after five or six years ago, being one of the only persons talking about it and being like, standing at a trade show with a chef hat giving away wooden spoons and having no one understand what the hell you're talking about 
wasn't fun. And having more people talking about it, I think is just, it's, it's really great. And so I think it's bright. And um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for people because even if you think of the role of a data scientist or a data engineer, you know, getting names, getting importance, well, the role of a data ops engineer itself will be really important. And if it even goes near what software did, you know, I released engineers 20 years ago who made less than every software engineer. And now hiring a dev ops engineer and a software team, it, they are paid equal to or above any of the software engineers because they really are important and really do a good job. And I think the role of a data ops engineer engineer is actually going to just increase over time and their pay is going to increase and the proportion of work that people are going to do on teams is going to increase. So I think it's bright, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, no, that's some great insight. It's interesting how you also mentioned how I believe you said you went to some type of convention where you're able to talk more about Data Kitchen and how no one really knew what you were talking about for data ops, it sounded like. And it's interesting because it's a huge method now, I think. Everybody's kind of really getting into it. A lot of companies are trying to use it to be able to keep up with the ever-changing technology and keep up with the competition against other companies as well. So great insight there. And so how has your experience been with talking to other companies now with data ops since you said in the past people didn't know what you were talking about, but how is it now? It's getting a lot better. And I think for a couple of reasons, one is there's just more resources because the people learn by browsing and Googling. So if you Google data ops, there's a lot of really good and interesting stuff come up and a lot of people are talking about it. And I think in some ways, data and analytics has gone through so many acronyms, right? ML, AI, big data you know, data science and all these, there's been enough growth that people have said, like, what else can you do with data, right? We've talked about every piece and all the pieces are in place and everyone sort of, in some ways, have started to explore all the nooks and crannies of actual, the what you can do with data. But the challenge remains how those teams work together, how they work with their data, how you want to try one tool versus another tool, that challenge remains. And so I think this operational side is going to, um, once the sort of boom is over, people are going to realize, wow, I've got to, I got to make my team work and I've got to convince people that the data I have and the insight is going to change the company. That's hard to do actually in data and analytics and, and that's really the, the challenge that I think data ops can help address. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important to also mention that there's so many things that you can do with data, as you mentioned, being able to analyze every nook and cranny and being able to also think about different innovative solutions to work with the data to find other outcomes from your technical findings and from all the numbers. Super important. But yeah, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today on our show. It was so great being able to learn more about your company and more about your perspective on data ops. And we at the Data Standard, we're trying to build a community of data thought leaders and data enthusiasts. Just so everybody has a place where they can all kind of network and collaborate with each other. So what is something that we can do for you? I'm really trying to promote data ops itself, right? And, and the ideas behind it. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for people and it's so new and so early and there's just a lot of white space to, to do and educate people on. So that, that process of sort of us collectively defining data ops and, and how it's going to be used, I think is just at its beginning. You know, if you look at other communities in software around DevOps, the community really drove a lot of the innovations. And I think that's just starting uh, to happen now and, and with regards to data and analytics. So I think there's just a, a big white space of opportunity for people to get into all the areas in, in data ops. Like we've actually done some webinars and how data ops applies to data governance and how data ops applies to security, how data ops applies to self-service analytics. And I mean, everyone's trying to be data driven. Everyone's trying to um, work in a more iterative and agile way, or a lot of people are, maybe not everyone. There's a lot of great opportunity for people to create and innovate in that world. I completely agree. And where can our community find you online to connect with you? Uh, if you just Google data ops, actually about half the things on the first page are from us. Um, so like uh, there in our companies at datakitchen.io is our, is our URL. Perfect. And to our community, uh, for more information on the data standard, you can find us at www.datastandard.io. This episode is sponsored by Pandio. They're innovating tech solutions with the Apache Pulsar messaging system. So learn more about their work at pandio.com. And thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. So great to speak with you and learn more about data ops and just how it's going to be innovating our future. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. 